afternoon. If I could get you all to um, draw your attention towards the stage, make sure that your phones are silent. <laughs> Okay, so good afternoon everyone. I'm Akaja Daniels and I'm an undergraduate here at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas and I major in public health with a minor in sociology. And so first I want to thank you all so much for coming today <laughs> to celebrate the one year anniversary of the intersection which is the Academic Multicultural Center right here on the first floor of the Student Union. And so their space has been available to students for a year now, and so much has grown and fruition since then. So first, I want to thank the intersection for hosting this event. And secondly, I want to thank all university dignitaries and community members that made this possible. So go ahead and give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> And most importantly, I want to thank Professor Kimberly Crenshaw for coming here to speak to us today. <laughs> As she is a professor of law at UCLA and Columbia School of Law, she has dedicated her work into revolutionizing civil rights, black feminist legal theory, race, racism, and the law as she is a global phenomenon that has been recognized for coining the terms intersectionality and critical race theory, we see that she has an effect on the global community. One of those examples is a part of the contribution to, or the influence in the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution in South Africa. And as she has gone through her career advocating activating and educating people on the diverse lives of our community. She has been a pillar for community activism. And so through my time as an undergraduate at UNLV, I have been able to have access to the scholarship in which she has created, and it has inspired me to become active in my own community. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mikasha, for that wonderful introduction. It's such a delight to be here. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Barlow for uh, moving heaven and earth to get me here. Um, everyone else from the intersection team and uh, uh, campus events uh, for also facilitating um, this time that I get to celebrate this first anniversary with you. Um, it's really a special honor to be able to celebrate an anniversary and when I was thinking about it I realized that I was also having a bit of an anniversary too um, that's not unrelated to the work that I do and, and the work that we're doing here together. Um, I'm sure many of you were aware that two weeks ago um, there was a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination in Memphis um, where he had traveled on an intersectional mission, actually, to um, confront the city over its treatment of sanitation workers. Um, and he understood that the intersection of race and of class were playing a role um, at that moment. Um, I remember the following day, uh, um, which was 50 years ago tomorrow, um, I was still reeling from the news that Dr. King had been assassinated. Um, I was a kid, I was in second grade, and I was witnessing the agony of my mother and my father um, upon learning this news. And I, it, it's, it's burned in my consciousness because I never had witnessed that kind of wrenching grief before. It's the first time I ever saw my father cry. Um, the sobs that they expressed, the anger, the despair that, that came over our whole family in waves that entire night really is just permanently etched into my consciousness. Uh, I got up the next day uh, and went to school along with all the other kids in my neighborhood and wisely the public school officials decided to release us all for classes to attend memorial services. I attended a memorial service along with all the kids in my uh, school at Jerusalem Baptist Church. And there we were all students from kindergarten to high school crowded into these wooden pews and the, and the uh, activists wanted us to talk about what King's life meant to us. 
So um, they asked the question, and we greeted that question with just silence for one moment, and then another moment, and another. It was a long, painful silence. For me to sit through this on top of the tragedy was just more than I could bear. I mean, it was an unspeakable tragedy as it was that a sniper's bullet sought to silence the demand for justice and freedom. But the insult to that injury was that we seem to be acquiescing to that silence by standing mute in the face of it. So it could be because that long night of grieving was just so raw in my heart. Before I thought the better of it, I was standing on my feet. Now, I can't really tell you that I remember exactly what I said in church that day. I do remember it was something about young people picking up the torch and completing Dr. King's journey, following his footsteps. You know, it's the kind of thing that people say in political mourning, particularly when martyrs are made. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where an impromptu speech from a second grader uh, would come from or whether it was well thought out. Um, it was much more of just a, a primal cry. Um, so by the time I got home, my parents had heard about this little uh, speech in Jerusalem Baptist Church. I really didn't know, you know, what their reaction was going to be. You know, I grew up where you're not supposed to talk in church, <laughs> right? Um, but um, they were still in tears. They wrapped their arms around me. Uh, they affirmed that indeed we didn't have any choice but to pick up where the martyr had fallen. So in the intervening years since then, 50 years since then, my work has centered on speaking back uh, against efforts to normalize, to accept, to acquiesce in what I consider to be an unjust status quo. So I've leaned heavily in this work on Dr. King, and in particular on one of his less known but most powerful indictments of American democracy. It was articulated during his famous March on Washington speech. You might not have heard about this when you studied the March on Washington. People like to focus on uh, his edict to be judged by the content of our character rather than the color of our skin. That one really got taken taken up into American, um, uh, American consciousness. But he also said during that speech that, that, that he and others had come to Washington, D.C. to cash a check, a promissory note of equality that was contained in the 14th Amendment that had come back marked insufficient funds. So doing the work that he claimed on that day, that work of closing the gap between the promise of American democracy and the reality uh, of material deprivation, that's been the work that so many of us have been doing. It's been the work that's been made most difficult when in the midst of the retrenchment on that promise in the, mid, in the middle of the 80s and 90s, an answer came back on this notion of the promissory note. That answer came back in the words of a Supreme Court justice who basically said that the debt had been paid in full. There were no creditors. There were no debtors, there was just Americans. Justice Scalia's frame summed up a logic that repackaged meaningful race reform into something quite different, into unconstitutional reverse discrimination. So under this framework, attentiveness to racial inequality, actions that would seek to further dismantle the racial exclusion, all of these actions became reframed as discrimination itself. It's a frame that took the mere diminishment of what I call, my colleague Luke Harris called, white male overrepresentation across American institutions as an offense to the Constitution itself, an injury that was on par with Linda Brown's struggle against racial segregation. It was seen as an insult to fairness 
and racial justice. So it's been against this particular framework that Justice Scalia articulates, the framework that in that equates diminishing the overrepresentation with the aftermath of segregation, extermination, and enduring forms of racial subordination, that critical race theory's critique of American inequality and law's role in insulating it has been the object of our work. Now this anniversary is particularly searing in the midst of what I consider the most profound unraveling of the racial justice agenda since the demise of the first reconstruction. That was Americans' experiment with a racially inclusive democracy in the aftermath of the Civil War. It's particularly disorienting coming after the celebratory atmosphere that was launched in 2008. These days in the United States, it's almost impossible to recapture the sense of hope in the invocation of Dr. King's legacy that accompanied the election of Barack Obama. We had reached, according to the pundits and the celebrants, the promised land. Yeah. Dr. King was superimposed on this historical moment. <laughs> One to which the hopeful term post-racial was attached. Race and racism were over, the pundits breathlessly declared, or at least nearly so, said some of the more cautious. But rather than a repudiation of racism and the recentering of King's actual vision, post-racialism turned out to be merely a kind of performance, a repudiation of a certain kind of race talk. Post-racial eventually signified a set of agreements about whether, how, and when Americans would talk about race. So when we did talk about race in this post-racial period, there seemed to be some kind of embargo placed upon the kinds of things that could be talked about. So discussions of race as a signifier of racial difference and inequality, that was still permissible. But discussing racism as a product of that inequality, not so much. So I'd like to think about post-racial discourse is using this pretty simple formula. First, in post-racial, you can't talk about racial difference, which is often the point of departure in debates about racial inequality. So unemployment, incarceration, wealth, health, and achievement gaps, these are all clear points of racial difference, racial inequality, that's blamed on social and cultural difference, like family structure, lack of work ethics, externalization of historical trauma, even listening to hip hop music, for example, is a racial difference that gets tied to inequality. These victim blaming explanations were not barred from the public debate during this so-called post-racial era. But other things were clearly barred from the debate. Genuine discussions about racial power were embargoed, including structural, institutional, historical, interpersonal dimensions of racial power, the reversal of any meaningful constraints on police, on employers, politicians, teachers, administrators, pretty much to do whatever they wanted to do as long as they didn't have a smoking rope attached to it. What we were left with was race talk without racism. Now, as I will suggest in just a bit, it was an agreement that many post-racialists signed on to and accommodated, including, to some degree, our newly elected President Obama. Now, as it happened, the shelf life of post-racialism, even in this limited frame, was far, far shorter than many of its cheerleaders supposed. A mere eight years later, a mere eight years later, the majority of white voters in this country, while voting the majority, um, while voting uh, for Donald Trump, 
toss this 2008 breakthrough into the dustbin of history. The symbolic breakthrough of his election has plainly given way to a new political order that is anything but post-racial. White voters across gender, across class, across region, overwhelmingly rallied to a presidential candidacy of a leader whose words and deeds amplified racism, sexism, ableism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, the list goes on. Now for most of us who simply follow the headlines in our newspapers, it really is hard to understand how quickly and fully this reversal of the forward momentum that was celebrated in Obama's election actually has come about. Beyond the shocking election of this president is a continuing crisis that separates those of us who oppose this regime into two warring camps. Our capacity for opposition has been undermined by this conflict through misdirected blame and for some a longing for identity politics, a past that was somehow more true to American ideals than all this talk about intersectionality. Even for some of us deeply worried about the rise of Trumpism and the politics of hate, resentment and violence, there's a sense that we don't have time for intersectionality. Now this to me is what's really bone chilling. It represents the emergence of a new and surprising target in the blame game, the so-called identity politics of intersectionality. They're all thrown onto the pyre of illicit social justice frameworks, but by some liberals and progressives. Pundits inside and outside of the academy have cast the emergence of Trumpism and its subsequent support for white nationalism as the inevitable consequence of an ill-begotten pandering to identity politics. Now these critics have argued that too much attention to diversity, too much attention to anti-racism, to feminism, to Muslims, to immigrants, to marriage equality, to trans rights, have created a backlash that propelled a self-professed, pussy-grabbing, race-baiting Islamophobe to the White House. The way out of this debacle by the lights of these pundits is to repudiate identity politics and return to the good old days when our common identity, just as Americans, held us together under one banner. Now, admittedly, those good old days might be hard to find behind all the business of enslaving and segregating black people, colonizing Mexican people, exterminating native people, excluding all Chinese people, denaturalizing South Asian people, interning Japanese people, institutionalizing disabled people, criminalizing queer people, domesticating women, and institutionalizing the rape and forced reproduction of black women. Now all these practices were perfectly consistent with so-called American values and with constitutional law. So against this history, this effect of blaming identity politics is to say that people who believed that it was legitimate to struggle against these abuses as aggrieved peoples have only themselves to blame for the crises unfolding in our republic today. It seems that now the response to the rise to ethno-nationalistic right-wing politics among some in the intelligentsia is not more social justice agitation, but actually less. Thus identity politics, along with its bionic and dangerous offspring, intersectionality, are the rogue forces on the discursive scene, those ideas that have to be disciplined if sanity is to prevail in 2018 and beyond. The consequences of this discourse for the coalition, the majority of voters who elected Obama and the majority of voters who voted for Clinton are profoundly disturbing. And the most visible political subjects of intersectionality within U.S. political discourses, black women, are particularly entrapped 
by this ahistorical analysis. This penalizing is not only ill-conceived and misdirected, but unpacking it reveals the ambivalence in the uninterrogated baselines within post-racialism that contributed to the emergence of Trumpism. Now this perspective threatens to silence and disempower the very same constituents who voted overwhelmingly against this dangerous turn in American politics and history. The ones who resisted the scapegoat politics, the ones who saw the anger and the inconfidence on display, the group that scored a 96% grade in getting it right and voting against this current occupant. That group would be, that group would be black women. Of course, by the lights of Trump apologists, it wasn't racial backlash that fueled this turn in American politics. Instead, as they tell it, it was the legitimate anger about economic and social losses that were overlooked or ignored by mainstream politicians. Now, let's take that seriously, right? It's about being overlooked and ignored in mainstream political discourse. All right, by this measure, if it was truly explanatory, once again, it should have been black women voting for Trump in droves. Single black women in their prime working years now have a median net wealth of less than $5 as compared to 42,000 for white women in the same age range. When it comes to wages, Latinas fare a little better, nearly half of Latinas work in jobs earning poverty level wages or lower, while 45% of Latinas between 18 and 64 have zero or negative net wealth. In fact, the median net wealth for all working age black women is only $100. They have less wealth than both their male counterparts and their white female counterparts. Yet they, along with women of color more broadly, have consistently been left out of the conversation about the economic and social crises unfolding in America today. Indeed, in discourses on a host of social ills from wealth erosion, income deterioration to sexual assault, police violence, mass incarceration, whatever the topic or the issue, whether framed as a race, gender, or class issue, women of color seem to fall out of the discussion. So if any constituency had reason to become exasperated with conventional political discourse to have felt ignored or overlooked, it would have been those voters. Yet, the lessons that might be learned, the agendas that might be corrected and expanded moving forward, have all been ignored, even by those who hope to reactivate this very constituency in the November election cycle. So the question we have to confront is why this problem continues and what must be done about it. Now, I want to share some thoughts about that today. Uh, with a more decidedly focused intersectional prism that reintroduces black women into the gentrified discourse of intersectionality. <laughs> now, I want to suggest that their stories of resistance have been forgotten, and because of that, the interest of our broader progressive constituency has been imperiled. Now, I want to say that in recentering black women in this intersectional narrative, I'm not intending to say that intersectionality is just about them. Intersectionality, as many of us in this room know from our use of the framework, can capture limitless number of interactions that reflect the convergences of multiple forms of domination that impact constituents constituencies all over the world. My point here is simply to mark the profound erasures that reverse the impetus that drove intersectionality's articulation in the first place. It grew out of the erasure of African American women in legal cases, and some current articulations of intersectionality seem to rehearse that same dynamic. I'm prompted to think like Malcolm X said about racism. Intersectional erasure is like a Cadillac. They bring out a new model every year. So I'm going to talk about black women. I hope that's okay. Yeah. 
Oh, well, that's okay. And I'm going to call these intersectional erasures failures, intersections of failure that we can see in the work of researchers, policy analysts, advocates, and others that fail to recognize the interconnections between various forms of discrimination. Instead, they articulate superficial conceptions of race and gender. And I want to say that these superficial conceptions have set the stage for weakened positions that force social progress into the retrenchment that we are facing today. So a significant part of the intersection failures that I elevate here are conceptual and political. They're amplified by political and misconstructions of intersectionality. So I'm going to give two examples of what I mean by the misconstruction of intersectionality. So I, I've felt in recent months when I've been asked to defend intersectionality against a variety of criticisms that um, it's almost like a groundhog day. You, you just never wake up from it or you wake up and it's the same conversation over and over again. And a common denominator in this conversation has been demands that share a sense of the extremely limited literacy around what intersectionality actually is all about. So a typical example of this is an interview that I gave to an academic trade magazine. I won't say what it is. Um, it could be any number of them. But it is a publication that supposedly keeps breast, abreast of academic matters. Now, intersectionality has been around since 1989. Yet the first time that this publication deemed it newsworthy was 2017. I learned that they wanted to ask me about the intersectionality wars. Now, surprisingly, the frame intersectionality wars was not a reference to, for example, the struggle to address state violence against black women. That might be considered an intersectionality war or the exclusion of women of color from contemporary policy discourses on racial inequality, you might consider that an intersectionality war, or the particular ways that immigration discourses overlook some of the unique consequences of status insecurity for women of color, also an intersectionality war. Nor was there concern about the housing crises wherein black women have been disproportionately evicted due to rising housing prices, falling wages, and the decline of public housing. The interview was not meant to be an opportunity to highlight the data that had emerged from the AAPF town halls across the country related to this concern, or the testimony by Native women that sexual abuse rates are so high in their communities that the issue is not what will happen if a woman is raped, but when. Nor was it about reports from the Justice Department around the Baltimore Police Department's abuse of women who were poor or homeless or trans or chemically dependent or involved in sex work. Nor was the interview an opportunity to explore testimony that we had developed about the criminalization of women of color. It wasn't it wasn't about the Oklahoma City trial and conviction of a police officer who was accused of raping eight women. The concerns that, in my mind, reflect the intersectionality wars were not the concerns of this story. It also, It wasn't a nuanced investigation of intersectional politics within our troubled coalition. It wasn't about the wars between those of us who were progressive. It wasn't about, for example, how mainstreaming marriage equality has marginalized families and people who could not be brought into they're just the couple next door with a twist kind of framework. Some of us are not with a twist. Or how racial justice discourse has mysteriously jettisoned structural inequality and women, the political constituency that was most active in 2008. 
None of these were the wars that prompted the interview. Instead, the interview sought my response to critiques that intersectionality itself was apparently the problem. The allegations against it, the bills of particulars, included its so-called caste-producing reversal of the privilege into the status of pariahs, its tendency to inspire religious zealotry, its pseudo-academic pretenses, and so on. I'm sure you've heard these. You know what they are. <laughs> there was zero interest in the people or the issues that have been erased through conventional knowledge and policy making frames. The objective of the interview wasn't to escort these overlooked subjects of intersectionality into the town square. The point was to pull over the vehicle that carried them to interrogate an idea that fit the description of a dangerous interloper in the gated community of legitimate academic discourse. Now, the interview did not address forms of power that intersectionality draws attention to, but it was an expression of the very power that intersectionality has attempted to disrupt. In this setting, the, inter the interrogation of the concept of intersectionality is exacerbated by the taken for granted irrelevance of intersectional subjects discourses, advocates, and proponents. Now, that, that, that one is a little heavy. This one is going to be a little lighter, a little more humorous, and related to the discrediting of those of us who sounded the alarm against Trumpism during the primaries. It was part of a larger piece that sought to dismiss some of the early critics uh, of Trumpism and of Trump. People like Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Danny Glover, Noam Chomsky, Eve Insler, they were all framed as a bunch of, of, of just out of control rabbit lefties. And I, I was watching this um, on uh, my uh, daily check-in with uh, this show, and then this happened. <laughs> She's highly critical of one president for Barack Obama. The reason? The show Obama launched the My Brother's Keeper initiative that mentors young black men in bad neighborhoods. Ms. Crenshaw objects to that because women of color are not included in the program. The teacher is also part of the legal team that tried to destroy Clarence Hunt's. So you can see what this young Trump group is all about. A bunch of radicals like this who apparently believe they can say pretty much anything, attack anyone, smear their own country, and all of that is okay. However, Donald Trump's opinion, not okay. And if we in the media report it, they're gonna get us. Or something. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Note that the scathing, disqualifying, scandalous critique of my assessment of Trump, the reason to completely disregard anything I might be a part of, was that I had agitated for gender equity in the president's racial justice initiative, MBK. And if that wasn't enough to completely and totally discredit me, this critique was buttressed by the fact that I had assisted Anita Hill's defense team. As if standing up for women and girls of color in either of these contexts was so completely indefensible that nothing more needed to be said to utterly destroy my credibility. Now, this wouldn't be the last time that O'Reilly and others would denigrate black women in defense of Trumpism. O'Reilly, as some of you may remember, while listening to a video of Representative Maxine Waters claimed, I didn't hear a word she said, I was looking at the James Brown wig. More recently, the president has gone on to attack Maxine Waters, an influential critic, as a very intelli unintelligent person. I wish I could imitate how he says it. <laughs> These remarks point to how little political capital black women and girls actually have in our culture. A fact entirely disproportionate 
to their level of political participation. After all, in both 2008 and 2012 elections, black women turned out in historically high numbers surpassing all other gender and race groups, a phenomenon that was crucial to the Democrats' success in winning and holding the White House. Most recently, they handed victories to Democrats in southern states of Alabama and Virginia. Just want to repeat that again. <laughs> Alabama and Virginia. And this is to say nothing about their leadership within political institutions and grassroots organizations. Still, the fact that standing up for or speaking as a black woman is in and of itself discrediting reveals how normal it is for black women and girls to be afterthoughts across the political spectrum. This is the consequence of a kind of power that has remained unnamed for too long. So let's try to name it. Let's call it racist patriarchy. <laughs> These intersectional failures have normalized the exclusion of women and girls from racial justice agendas and have undermined the political capital of political and progressive communities as a whole. But I want to go a little further. I want to posit that these intersectional failures have contributed to the conditions of Trump's possibility. And I want to locate, I'm going to be a, a little tough here, I want to locate intersectional failures that unfolded within the black community. Now for this we have to take a visit to the Supreme Court that decided two cases that I think history may show played a significant role in handing the White House over to 45. Consider Citizens United, the case that eliminated campaign finance laws that were designed to protect our electoral system from becoming a wealth-based market democracy, and Shelby versus Holder, a case that effectively eliminated the Voting Rights Act. Now, both of these cases were decided by a 5-4 majority. Five for majority. The fifth vote in these cases, and countless other cases that have rolled back civil rights enforcement, labor laws, criminal procedure protections, so many other rules that have secured our basic rights, that fifth vote, <laughs> Clarence Thomas. An African American who replaced the civil rights giant Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court. Now, my point here isn't to bemoan how far we've fallen from the heights of Thurgood Marshall. My point is to question what role intersectional failures played in installing this fifth vote to the Supreme Court. And here we come to Anita Hill. Case study in intersectional failure. Now, before Anita Hill came forward, Many African Americans, heeding Thurgood Marshall's warning that simply being black was no guarantee that any nominee would lift up the civil rights legacy that was so important to sustaining the forward momentum of the civil rights movement. African Americans were split on whether they supported this particular Bush appointee. In fact, there was lackluster support at best. He'd been groomed to be precisely what he was a vote to dismantle key decisions that emerged from the civil rights revolution. But after Anita Hill came forward and nominee Thomas declared that he was a victim of a high-tech lynching by the Judiciary Committee, millions of black folks changed their minds and came over to his side in droves. They called Anita Hill a traitor a black woman who was acting like she was white by acting as though she had never encountered anything like that talk before. Even if she was telling the truth factually, even if Clarence Thomas said all the things that she testified that he in fact said, some still considered her to be a liar. In the view of notable scholars like Orlando Patterson, who called her testimony disingenuous. She had lifted a verbal style that carries only minor sanction in one subcultural context and thrown it into mainstream neo-Puritan America where it was considered a problem. 
As a black woman, he asserted, she should have been able to easily handle Thomas's advances, apparently. In other words, apparently, sexual harassment was a white woman's hang up. Black women wouldn't have felt harassed by this behavior. Now here's a moment where intersectional amnesia really set in. This argument that sexual harassment was not a black woman's thing reflects an astonishing failure to recognize that sexual harassment has been a condition of black women's work since they arrived on these shores. It's the reason why black women like Diane Williams, Paulette Barnes, Pamela Price, Sandra Bundy, and Michelle Vinson were the initial plaintiffs in lawsuits that created this area of law for all women. As a consequence of the silencing of black women's struggle for sexual autonomy, anti-racist forces ended up contributing to the elevation of Clarence Thomas by shoring up his lackluster support among many senators who actually relied heavily on their black constituencies for re-election. Here, intersectional ignorance made black communities complicit in creating a Supreme Court that has gone on to undermine the entire civil rights infrastructure. Now, white feminists, while supportive of Anita, were not blameless in this moment either because their feminism repudiated the racial concerns that underwrote the painful drama for so many black women. They argued that race had nothing to do with it or that race trumped gender, denying the very foundations of black women's exceptional vulnerability to harassment and the tragic choices they often had to make to tell their stories. Now this forced 1,500 or more black women to take out an ad in the New York Times entitled African American Women in Defense of Ourselves to serve as a public reminder that the silencing of black women was a continuing legacy of slavery and this ongoing debacle. The upshot was a painful chapter in history that really has yet, yet to shift the way that anti-racism and feminism are all too often put at odds with one another. Thomas's fifth vote represents the wages of this intersectional failure. It continues to pay dividends to the forces of American retrenchment. Now, what this moment wrought for the future was voting repression unleashed by the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, which led to the disenfranchisement of millions of people in the last presidential election. People like 100-year-old Grace Hardison, who was removed from the voting rolls simply because her mail was returned as undeliverable despite having voted consistently after the Voting Rights Act was passed for decades. Or Gladys Harris of Wisconsin, who misplaced her driver's license just a few days before the election, and despite bringing three forms of legal identification, including her Medicare and Social Security cards, was unable to vote. 200,000 voters were without needed identification in Wisconsin, significantly more than the 20,000 or so votes that constituted the margin of victory for the victor in that state. There were even some women like Sammy Bates in Texas who supporting her family on $300 per month social, social security checks had to choose between buying the birth certificate that she needed to vote and feeding her family. With such profound consequences, it seems abundantly apparent that intersectionality matters. Now, what is intersectionality and what is intersectional failure? I've been using the word several times and built it into this concept of intersectional failure. So I need to step back and pull in the folks who might be unfamiliar before we go further to offer some basic points about intersectionality. Now, intersectionality is at first a frame. It's a way of looking at things. Frames are important. They tell us what we need to know about a scene, about a problem, a social dynamic, and what needs to be done about it and who needs to be doing the doing. 
Now, I could go into a deep theoretical conversation about this, but I have some friends that tend to help me make this point a lot clearer. These are my friends that travel with me. They're cows and they're sick. So this is a call and response moment for those of you who don't know the tradition. So I'm going to say the cows are sick. Who's responsible for the sick cows? The farmer. Thank you, call and response, A plus person. The farmer. So I have asked this question in dozens of speeches all over the country, all over the world. Everywhere, everyone says the same thing. Right, the farmer. Why do we say the farmer? Well, because this framing of the problem, along with our cultural inferences, lead us to believe if you have a problem, we see the problem in that frame, we assume that the person responsible is the person that owns them. They own the problem. It's the farmer. But if we change the frame and ask the same question, we get a different answer. Right? This gives us a sense of how the way we frame, the way we look at a problem, gives us a different sense of inferential causality, a different sense of responsibility, a different sense of what the ramifications of the cow's sickness might be to those of us who are also in that frame, but we didn't know it when we were looking at the initial frame. Right? So framing tells us everything we need to know about a social problem. Frames make a difference then, right? If you have a narrow frame, you will infer that the problem is a problem that's owned by the individual. So let's go back and say that the sick cows, the disease that we're talking about is inequality, right? That's the disease. Under the initial frame, who's responsible for the disease? Well, basically the people who have the disease. Right? What is the reason why? Well, let's see. Maybe they're grazing in the wrong place. Maybe they're listening to too much hip hop. <laughs> Maybe there are not enough bulls in the herd. There are all sorts of ways that we can blame the group for their own responsibility. We can say that the problem rests in the actual group itself. When we broaden the frame, and let's say that those clouds are historic forms of exclusion and inequality, police violence, standardized tests that are not standardized to all people but to some people. If it's implicit bias, a lot of bias isn't even implicit. Let's say all of those clouds represent the toxic environment that produces inequality. When we have a broader frame, it broadens our conception about what we need to do about the problem and who's responsible for it. Now, intersectionality is also a frame. It is a word picture that better captures the reality of social power and discrimination. It's a frame that draws on everyday experiences that we all have navigating intersections in which, in which traffic is coming from multiple directions and we understand that sometimes when things come in multiple directions we encounter it simultaneously. That is effectively what intersectionality is. Now why was intersectional analysis necessary. The necessity that was the mother of this particular invention was a need to explain why courts were wrong to reject discrimination claims by black women against industries that were segregated by race and by gender. In these industries there were jobs for blacks and jobs for women but many times the jobs for blacks were not for blacks who were women and the jobs for women were not for women who were black. <laughs> In this setting, Emma de Graffenried was a black woman who sued her employer for refusing to allow her to compete for a job as a black woman. The company said, you can't get us for race discrimination because we hire black people and you can't get us for gender discrimination because we hire women. The fact that neither the blacks who were hired were women or the women who were hired were black didn't really seem to matter that much. So intersectionality was a way of framing what was wrong with this particular problem, what the court was missing. The fact that in this instance, these plaintiffs were situated in a place where aspects of their identity overlapped with the structural rules that dictated how the workforce would be constituted. This was the impact of racism and sexism, not just their identity, but how the structure actually made their identity a disadvantage.
Now, more broadly, intersectionality looks at what happens when these social forces overlap, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Black women, like other women of color and social marginalized people all over the world, were facing consequences of multiple intersections of racism, of sexism, classism, xenophobia, ableism, heterosexism, transphobia, conventional feminism, anti-racism, and other social justice movements weren't paying attention to the ways that these vulnerabilities were co-constituted. A lot of things get missed when we understand social problems in ways that only foreground those who are most privileged in the categories rather than those who are not. But the problem isn't just intersectional vulnerability, the stuff that happens in that intersection. The problem is when these things happen and those allies discourses, laws that are developed to address accidents don't know what to do when it happens in the intersection. It's like when the ambulance arrives, the gender ambulance arrives, gender on the ambulance, we're coming to pick up the people who have been impacted by gender discrimination. Oh, whoa, wait, here's someone where we can't really see if the tread marks are exclusively from gender. Looks like there was something else going on there too. And the tendency is to say, not our problem, get in the ambulance, back away. Same with respect to racial justice. So the problem has been the way that not just the structures produce the inequality, but the way our social justice advocacy, our laws, our interventions are not up to the task of addressing that. Now, our communities as a whole lose out when the intersectional dimension of racial injustice or of patriarchy aren't addressed, and we many times don't see it because we have a conventional understanding of the problem. So now let me go back to the thing that I got a lot of trouble for having said. That is that the president's racial justice agenda was problematic because it excluded women and girls of color. Now, it was legitimately based on the reality that Mike Brown, uh, 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 Trayvon Martin, um, uh, Michael Jordan, they, they were subject to racialized forms of, of violence. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. It was an important point of departure. It was additionally based on statistics that said boys who were, for example, uh, single mo uh, born to single mothers, more likely to be poor, to go to under-resourced schools, have less experienced teachers, were more likely to underachieve, to have less positive outcomes overall. These were real problems, and they were vital problems to exist. It was important that the president do so. The question was, more likely than whom? More likely than whom? Certainly not more likely than their sisters living in those same households. According to the relevant research, not more likely than their sisters, they found, the Institute for Women's Policy Research found that this exclusively male frame was more accurately a race problem, one that impacts girls and youth of color across all genders, yet they were left out of the picture. If anything, they were to only benefit as trickle-down beneficiaries in the long run over the president's efforts to create better, better citizen workers, better husbands, better fathers. I won't say too much about why that might be a problem for a lot of women, but Overall, the perspective brought back a 50-year-old idea that racial justice for black Americans turns on a male single earner family wage model. Now, this idea about male as the center of the family was in eclipse even at the time that this was articulated. Note marriage equality, note disruption of the binary concept of gender. All this stuff was happening everywhere else. But when it came to racial justice, we were back to 1950s, right? We were back to this idea that the reason why there's inequality is because we have so many female-dominated households. 
holds, right? So this idea rests on the belief that as long as we hold constant the idea that females are paid less for the same work, shut out of many jobs in which no child care is provided, only in that world would it make sense that a poverty program that targets inequality among people of color need only focus on men. Right. So these erasures are foundational to today's post-racial discourse. Um, they're foundational to the to the the, the overarching um, coalitions between those who are fearful of men of color and those who fear for men of color. What happens to those who no one fears and no one is uh, concerned about, right? Those are largely women of color. So I want to suggest that we are now in a place and a time where there's a new picture of interracial, intersectional erasure. It may be girls of color. If we look at uh, the school to prison pipeline, while well, it's known that boys of color, black boys in particular, are three times more likely to be suspended than their white male counterparts, it is a national crisis. It is also the case that black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than their white female counterparts. That is a racial injury that has not typically been part of our conversation. I have to say, we did this research, we found when we actually started to look at expulsions, at expulsions, the disparity was so great that we couldn't even fully calculate the ratio. Because in the year that we looked in New York, there was not one white girl who had done something that warranted her expulsion. So we had to make up, let's suppose there was a white girl who had gotten expelled. <laughs> if there was, it would be a ratio of 53 to 1. That's what we're looking at in terms of the racial disparity among women, among girls. We're so not used to talking about racial disparity among women and girls. This entire disparity is simply not part of the school to prison pipeline. And there's absolutely no reason why it's not, because being pushed out of school is one of the early risk factors for a lifetime of unequal consequences for girls and women of color and their entire family. A lot has been made about the question question of uh, black girls and their achievement, one of the things that people don't recognize is that although black girls start off closer to their white female counterparts, they fall dramatically behind by the time they reach fourth grade. So when the conversation moves to looking at the crises of young children and it's only a male-based conversation, look at what we're missing. Look at what's not part of the dialogue, right? And lastly, there are questions about whether there is a dramatic difference in achievement among uh, black women in higher education. While it is true that black women matriculate more, it is also true that they leave college with more debt. It's also true that the dollar value of their investment still doesn't reach the dollar value investment over a lifetime of earnings that their male and, and white female counterparts have. So these are the kind of disparities that you overlook if you don't have an intersectional framework. Now, I want to not fail to mention that this is not simply a problem of top-down, it's not just a presidential problem, it's not just policy, it's not just foundations, it's all of that, but we also have the same problem of intersectional erasure when we're talking about grassroots campaigns. And here I want to end with movements against racial state violence and state violence against women. In 2014, my think tank, the African American Policy Forum, launched Say Her Name. It's a campaign to bring awareness and support to families of women who've been victimized by racist police violence. Now, um, let me just see if we've made any progress in the last uh, two years. I'd like everybody to put up just one hand in the air. Everyone put up one hand in the air. And when you hear a name of someone you don't recognize, I want you to put the hand down and leave it down. Okay, Mike Brown. Okay, Tamir Rice. Philando Castillo. Eric Garner. Let's try Stephen Clark. Okay, so most hands are still up. Tanisha Anderson. Maya Hall. K. 
Kayla Moore, Corinne Gaines, India Beatty, India Kager. All right, thank you. So it looks like we have two hands still up. I think all you know, these are all African Americans, you can put your hands down, um, who have been uh, killed by police. The difference should be obvious. Of the names we know, um, we know the names of male-bodied people who've been killed by the police. We know them. What we do not know, those who've lost their lives in obscurity have been black women. These are the names we do not know. Black women and girls have been killed in every conceivable way. Black females as young as seven, as old as 93, have been killed by police. They've been killed on the streets, in their cars, outside of their homes, in their living rooms, in their bedrooms, even in their beds. They have been killed when police raid their homes on mistaken warrants. They have been killed when their family members have sought help. They've been killed when the men they are with were targeted. They've been killed while they've been alone. As women, they've been killed driving while black, shopping while black, having a mental disability while black, having an emotional crisis while black, being the domestic violence victim while black, being homeless and poor while black. They've been strangled to death, beaten to death, tasered to death, shotgun to death, sometimes beaten repeatedly, sometimes shot at close range, sometimes in the back. The vast majority were unarmed and few were engaged in activity that remotely justified the use of deadly force. That they are women does virtually nothing to counter the claim that deadly force was justified. They are described by police as superhuman, as posing by the sing simple look on their face a threat to the well-being of armed officers. No matter their condition, their age, their circumstance, they are never damsels in distress, women in crisis, women in fear. They are social problems that need to be handled and punished. Unlike their male counterparts, their names are not frequently mentioned or held up as examples of racism. Their subjugation and their absence in our collective memory is the embodiment of racist patriarchy. So here again, we've got historical amnesia. Here again, we have defining issues in a way that excludes a segment of the population. And it's not just racial justice. Don't let me allow you to think that it's just that issue. Think about how sexual abuse is thought about. Sexual abuse is the second most common complaint against police officers. Second most common complaint. Is police abuse part of the contemporary discourse about gender-based violence? Not even close. So this guy, not a poster child for gender-based violence. Why? Because he's a police officer. Why? Because he believed that assaulting women who were black, who were poor, who were homeless, some who were chemically dependent, some who were system involved, was something he could repeatedly and consistently do without any consequence whatsoever. This is a vulnerability that's made possible because we don't have a language about this. So before Me Too, before Time's Up, when these women were intersectionally made marginal and, and vulnerable, no women's groups showed up except now to support them and no civil rights organization showed up. So what is happening to women in Police cruisers, jails, prisons, public housing projects happens out of sight. These are not the women that we see on the cover of news magazines. These are not the women that come to mind when we say time's up. Their invisibility extends the erasure of this woman. This is Reese Taylor. Reese Taylor is part of a long history of the civil rights movement that we've forgotten. She was raped by a gang of white men in Alabama in 1944, kidnapped at gunpoint. She refused to accept that those men who raped her would not be punished. So she went on to form an organization called the Committee for Equal Justice for Ms. Reese Taylor. It sprang to life with notables such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell. It was founded by Reese and one other woman, Rosa Parks. See, quiet as it's kept, 
Rosa Parks didn't start the civil rights movement by accident or because her feet were tired. She didn't stumble into history and her principal contribution wasn't simply getting arrested that day. She cut her teeth on defending black women against the legal system that sanctioned their sexual abuse. She organized for women who were not able to organize for themselves. This organization was not successful in her case, but it became the backbone for the Montgomery bus boycott, a campaign that changed everything. This is the kind of leadership from the margins that moves history. This is what we are seeing playing out in Alabama and in Virginia. But for us to fully benefit from it, we have to have some very difficult conversations among ourselves. Intersectionality is only a way forward if we're willing to face some hard truths, recover some aspects of our history that have been forgotten, and, and sometimes, sometimes risk being told we're not good allies because we insist on justice for all of us. I thought I might leave you with a quote from Dr. King, but on reflection, I want to leave you with a source of inspiration for me. It's Vicki McAdory. We in the Say Her Name movement, we call her Auntie Mama. She was the aunt of India Beatty, one of the women killed by police in 2015. Um, she marched with us at the Women's March. She was a warrior for justice. And when we last talked to her, um, she was insisting on telling us to continue the work, even though she might not be there with us. I didn't like the sound of that. She said it a little too much. I ignored what she was telling me. After we hung up the phone about five hours later, she had a massive stroke and passed away. Um, she was an immediate survivor of police violence, but I count her as a casualty. I believe the pain of losing a loved one and suffering this injustice in, in isolation added to the stress and the trauma that led to her early death. I'm fortunate to have known her. She left us um, with a commitment that was, that was palpable. It was, it, was, it was in everything she did and she said. She's given us support in ways that can never uh, subside. Um, I'm going to leave you with her I'm words. I'm not just a soldier for Andy and Beatty. I'm a soldier for every one of our children that have been unjustifiably taken away from us. They see her face and they know her name. And I'm going to ensure that they remember her name. My um, purpose and my goals and my reason um, for so many things has changed us in the past year. Um, I have, I have a fight in me. I have a strength in me that I didn't have before. At this point, my my sole purpose is to get justice for not only NDB but every one of these beautiful, beautiful people. Our babies may have lost their breasts. But they have not lost their words. And if the loss of our baby can save somebody else's baby, they have left my name. And they would never, never close out the family of our children. I, I'm going to be as peaceful as I can. And I'll sit back and I'll listen. But I just want people to understand and rest, be rest assured that I'm going to get up, I'm going to shout on the screen, I'm going to make this mark the damn noise that I have to make until this crap is a part of our history. This is, supposed, this is not supposed to be black people's destiny. It's not supposed to be black girls' way of life. This is going to be black history. We were slaves. And they're trying to push us back. That ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Because we as women, we built this country. My biggest fear would be not to march. My fear would be realizing that I didn't put my all to something that's right. That's something that we was born into a right of having 
And I leave you with that. How can we not? Thank you. next part of the Q&A and I'll give the presenters a chance to introduce themselves but they're going to answer a few questions from the poll that was sent out to everyone and then we'll be taking three live questions from there when we have a chance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi everyone, we're going to start off with introductions. My name is Kamisha Fagan, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the president of UNLV's NAACP chapter. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Hamilton. I am the co-president of Black Lives Matter and the secretary of NAACP. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. I'm Courtney Jones and I'm Vice President of Black Lives Matter as well. We do a few um, things with the Center for Social Justice on campus as well. Okay. All right, now we will facilitate a Q&A session. These questions have been submitted by our very own student body and lastly, Dr. Crenshaw will be answering three live questions from the audience. So um, right before we start our first question, um, we were asked if we had any kind of comments on things that were said today and um, some of the questions in general. And I think some things definitely that I took from the talk would be um, when we started talking about the video that you showed us and people were saying, you're, you're just going to say anything. They told her she was just going to say anything. And I think that what I took from that is if that's just saying anything, then like who are we? When we bring black women, when we bring women of color into the conversation, that's not just saying anything. That's saying that someone's life matters, and so I kind of appreciated that a lot. Mm -hmm. First question? Sure. So our first question for you would be, what is your take on how people have co-opted intersectionality from the original definition and the original intention, and how do we move away from that and move toward the original focus? Well, you know, I think most of the last hour has been my response to that, right? And, and, and I understand that the questions came before people had the benefit of the talk. So I, I guess I would want to, because I've, I've said, I want to have a conversation, y'all. Let, let's, let's make it live, not memoric. So um, I, I, I talked about uh, the consequences of co-optation. Uh, I talked about some examples of co-optation and um, tried to put uh, intersectionality in a conversation about its contemporary relevance in light of where it came from. I'm curious as to whether in that talk you all got a sense of what co-optation looks like and, and, and examples that might come from your own work about that co-optation. So, I see what I see. What are you guys seeing around co-optation? <laughs> okay, um, so I think that one of the things that um, I run across um, organizing with the Black Lives Matter chapter that we started here is that when we um, talk about police violence, there's kind of the way that say her name is pitted against like everyone else. So to go into the spaces and see that queer black women are the ones that are being amplified, they're the ones that the focus is centered on, that people are like, whoa, this is exclusionary. There's a lot of explaining that you have to do, but it's like that explanation is like worth it and you also have to educate yourself on it. And those spaces are very particular for a reason and they're made for a reason because they need to exist and um, I've also <laughs> noticed the people that are interested 
um, in these kind of topics usually share similar identities mm -hmm. as well. So, so let, let me let me just ask more clarification because um, I think I'd, I'd like to like populate categories of examples. So that seems to me an example of intersectional um, failure, intersectional exclusion. Like we think that the movement against police violence is only about these bodies and not these. Um, so let's put that on the list of, and that's still going on with respect to police violence. And then there's the, the moments of people who actually are using intersectionality, but using it in, in ways that you all would consider co-opting. So are there, are there examples of co-optation that really deeply bother you? Not, not intersectional rejection, but intersectional co-optation. And so what are they? Yeah, definitely. I really want to more audience. I'll bring it to Omi. Did you want to also? Sure. Okay. And then we can bring it back up here too. Yeah, I probably don't even need a mic to be honest with you. I'm quite <laughs> um, I would say for me, examples of, so I teach and I say that I'm fat, black, and queer. Um, so I try to show up and I try to, you know, have that forefront in whatever it is that I'm doing. But like recently I participated in a panel um, somewhere and we were having conversations about the way that queerness and womanness is often represented in different spaces, right? And I feel like intersectionality has become one of those things that's been put on the checklist, so to say. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there is work that's expected for us to have, that's expected to be done for women and that black women are expected to do it. But then when we say, why don't you see yourselves reflected in the spaces that we're in and then also do the same work? It's kind of more or less along the lines of, well, but we are women, right? So it just seems like even, for example, these movements, the Me Too movement, right? Everybody's talking about how it was started and all these Hollywood figureheads, right? And then nobody's talking about Tarana Burke. It's like women is supposed to be very general um, in terms of who's being supported, but we never see those names, but then the question, but then it's always, but we're just women, right? So it just, for me, that's where it seems to be kind of popping up and it bothers me a lot um, because nobody wants to talk about how women is white um, in a lot of mainstream ways, particularly in a lot of organizations or in places where folks are considered to be marginalized. Like an example, the, the um, conference that I went to, which was queer, but then when I say it's white queer, right, that it's, well, you need to work on your own space, but I'll just help you build this space. Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. for me, that's where it gets to be funny. Yeah, 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 very good, very good. Can I just talk? No, because they want to hear you. And hear you in the other room too. So. Hey, y'all, Jamila. You probably see me or hear me a lot. Um, so, what I noticed around campus, in particular around criminality, is that we have like a cannabis club here. But with the cannabis club, we don't talk about how women of color have been um, criminalized for like small amounts of marijuana charges and how that's been affected by the war on drugs, but they want to talk about cannabis use and about the war on drugs, but not the war on women, as well as other movements like um, there is a girl, a young girl right now who is facing up to 26 years um, in prison for a post online, Tony Strickland, say her name, because it matters and because she's young. And it's like when these things are happening in our communities, people aren't bringing that attention to it. So we'll have a March for Our Lives, but not mention Tony Strickland and how that really affects the March for Our Lives and the, for the lives of black young women and for the lives of our young people as marginalized folks. So that's a problem. I'm seeing here and I want to address that because when we don't say their names and when we don't get involved that's silencing their voice as well as my voice as well as my little sister's voice and further on so that's what I've noticed as a problem yeah, yeah, yeah. so so I'm, I'm hearing examples of uh, intersectional failures right so for the most part they're intersectional failures with with a, a, a little bit of a shout out to intersectional uh, co-optation because I would imagine that the conference would claim that it's an intersectional space but in that space they do the intersectional exclusion or intersectional failure right so um, so so 
so I, I, I think categorizing these different intersectional problems is, is important. And I've, I've also seen just straight out co-optation, like, you know, um, groups branding themselves do, as doing intersectional work, and you ask, well, what's intersectional about what you do? Right. And, and many people just think, oh, well, you know, we're diverse. Right. So, so there's this, um, I, I think, um, assumption that intersectionality is basically just today's word for diversity. And that's not really how I think about intersectionality. You know, I, it's not necessarily hostile to it, but it's not the, it's not the same thing. And so because um, it, it's, it feels like it's a modern word, it's not, I mean, shoot, it's been around for over 30 years. So I, I, people get a sense that, okay, we're all intersectional now. Well, no, we're not all intersectional now, right? Just because we have um, a diverse place, just because we can say, hey, I'm many different things, doesn't mean that being different things means that you're attending to many different forms of subordination as they come together. That's intersectional, it's not diverse. I actually find that really true, um, especially here on campus. That just kind of brings something back. Definitely not trying to call us out, but I'm just saying, I just hear in a lot of offices, um, interdisciplinary, gender and ethnic studies, um, in different offices, we keep saying diverse, and then how are we out here actually serving folks? And I think that it's so important, the people we have in the room, because this is what's going to make the difference on campus, and we're going to make the difference on campus. And even people that weren't able to make it today, they're thinking about these same things, and we have to be able to make that difference on campus through the framework that we were talking about today. Yeah, uh, and I think an example of, a popular example of intersectional co-opting is the Pepsi commercial in, what year was that, 20, was this like 2016? Mm -hmm. Right, I think that is like the, my, that is my first idea of intersectional co-opting because they had someone with, uh, someone with, uh, I don't, I don't want to mispronounce it, but she had a rap. Sorry, or a hijab. A woman with a hijab. Then you had some black guy skateboarding or like break dancing or whatever. Then you had uh, a police police officer. You know, I mean, we all have seen it before, right? I remember seeing that and laughing my ass off and thinking how stupid it was and how they are fetishizing and tokenizing intersectionality. And again, like you said, not addressing the problem instead of just saying like we're all living together, human race type situation. And there and. Uh, I've met people who, and the, the issue with that is that it's not just like a commercial and it's not, and it's not just a company, it's actually like people who think that way and see that as, a, as the, like, a, like you said, diversity, seeing that and not seeing like inclusion, not seeing the proponents of inclusion, mm -hmm. not just kind of just echoing what you were saying. So I just think that's a really good example of uh, intersectionally being co-opted and not really being taken seriously. So, so let me build on that and, and, and sort of turn to, so what's our responsibility in the face of co-optation, right? Because, um, you know, quite honestly, when I first started uh, thinking about this, it wasn't a context in which there was a lot of conflict within the anti-violence movement, the anti, um, you know, gender-based violence movement. And some of, some of my allies were of the mind that because traditional uh, feminist critiques did not address race and other forms of, um, of other structures, that it was the responsibility of the you know the feminists to do that work. And and I didn't I didn't believe that. Right? I actually believe that. It was their responsibility to acknowledge that the framework that they had was not complete. It was their responsibility not to advocate on behalf of a wholeness that no one could provide. It was their responsibility to create space for those of us who were advocating around this issue to be able to advocate it with the particularity that our experiences brought to the table. It was our responsibility to theorize what difference our difference made. It was our responsibility to show the distinction between tokenistic inclusion and not be satisfied by that, but also provide what substantive inclusion was. And many times the failure to do that meant that people settled with the tokenistic inclusion because no one was saying otherwise, right? So the idea was you didn't say me, um, you, didn't, you didn't give me a shout out. But that meant that that's all people had to do, was to have a list, but not actually articulate 
what difference that list made in terms of the ability of those frameworks to actually address the, the particular ways that violence impacted different women differently. And until, I think, we take up that task in every place that we are, we're always going to be confronting co-optation. We're always going to be confronting tokenism, right? It's up to us to say, I, I understand what your instinct was, and I, I, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> but I also want to say we got to go a little deeper. And here is what you can use to go deeper. I don't want to put it in the hands of, of, of folks who don't fully understand the experience. And I mean that not just within feminism, I mean it within anti-racism as well. I don't think it's clearly the responsibility of um, male identified people and people who identify with the male experience of racism to be the ones to articulate. And we, we, you know, fold our show, uh, you know, fold our arms until they get it right. No, it is our responsibility to work with our allies to get it right. And, and a lot of times that is hard work for us. We've got to come up with the examples, the articulations, the theorization, and then we've got to advocate for that theorization to be incorporated within the prevailing ways that we think and move in these issues. And sometimes we don't really always, you know, want to do that. It's hard work. It doesn't make you popular. People don't want to see you coming like, oh, here she comes with that. <laughs> We do have a, a comment from Dr. Shigag. Hi, I'm Dr. Shigag. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Community Health Sciences, and I think that it's co-opted in health okay. and healthcare all the time. They talk about, you know, we the intersection of like health and race, or health and wealth, or health and outcomes, mm -hmm. and all of that. But they never, and it always stops short. You know, like if we look at heart disease or cardiovascular disease, we're quick to talk about it and we talk about all the men we're losing, yet we're losing more women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, African American women, the more education you have, the less like you are to have successful birth. Mm -hmm. That's not low birth and weight people or, and people don't know that. There's all of these things that are connected and we never discuss them. More women die from cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, like the young woman you, sh you showed mm -hmm. across the line. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about, you know, we still characterize heart attacks. As, uh, as white men yeah. or in phenotypic things like turning red mm -hmm. and so you see and they're like but we're, we're dressing it because now we say it might hurt <laughs> instead so you see that it's like they, they use the word if you look at medical and especially healthcare information and data and education they talk about the intersection but then they never take it as far as to say women or men mm -hmm. or if they do they say men mm -hmm. and they'll say well if we save the men then we'll save the women mm -hmm. And so I see it being left out of the discussion completely all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So um, uh, I want to uh, just add to, to that and, and pause for a moment and really lift up what you said about uh, maternal mortality. Yes. You know, the, the rates of maternal mortality uh, place the black women in the United States at the at the level of developing you know countries, mm -hmm. right? And we can't forget like Serena Williams is an Almost. example yes. that everybody knows about, right. and that you know she didn't basically lose her mind, and then she's characterized as an angry black woman, right. which then comes into respectability politics, and if you don't want to be you know characterized that way and all of that, That's right. but there's so many more people who are dying yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I think um, a just we have to pause and really look at that and have to look. I have to say I was I've been complaining a lot about the fact that when the New York Times finally does a front page story about a racial inequality, it never focuses on a racial inequality that women face. It's like what about you know maternal mortality? So like two weeks ago they finally did you know a story about it, but you know for the most part what it forces people to deal with is the easy resort that people take to understanding dis disparate health outcomes. Basically, well, of course, you know, black women are going to have disparate out uh, outcomes because they're less likely to be insured, less likely to be, to have access. This is the example that turns that on their head, right? So people have to grapple with the fact that it's truly intersectional. It's not just, you say it's about race, but it's really, got, it's not just about, you know, access to healthcare. It's about a whole range of things that 
um, the very fact that the more education you have, the, the, the more you're subject to it. It's telling you that there's something about the experience of being embodied in this way that actually is a risk factor when you are pregnant. Well, and they know it's stress. Yes. They know that it's the stress and the, and the understanding of, I'm sorry. They know that, you know, the only thing they have been able to find, at least through research, and this isn't new. I mean, it's been out for more than 20 years. They know that it's, it's stress. The stress of being the mother, the wife, the professional, the daughter, the whatever, that all of those stresses come together and it becomes a fight or flight. And the body's gonna reject the baby before it dies. And so we know that that's the challenge. But then how do you meet that challenge, especially when nobody's talking about it? And then, you know, they wanna, I mean, like a 14-year-old Latino is more likely to have a successful birth than a woman with a, gradu- a black woman with a graduate degree. I mean, it's it's high, and it's always kind of like, well, we're you know we're we're trying to prevent teenage pregnancy. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But that's you know within inside of healthcare and within inside of even the field of public health, that's where it gets lost. Yeah. You know, so it's that whole idea. And then if you say something, well, then you're just being angry. (laughs) So. Yes. Thank you. Hi, it's a, it's a pleasure to um, be here. I'm really excited. Um, I've read your work in a, in a course. Um, and so my question to you is essentially, as a young person uh, developing my own voice, how, and I, I, I recall your story of when you were in second grade and you gave that speech and your parents had a particular response. As a young person developing my own voice, um, what, what things can I learn from your own personal experiences um, developing your own voice so that I could, I don't know, mimic or <laughs> use them? And I'm sure everyone else here would, would love to, to hear that as well. So I, I'm really cautious about extrapolating you know, from, from my own history. So I tell stories, and if there's something that you know, resonates, like the story that I just told. So, um, for me, I found that when I try to apply myself to issues, to uh, intellectual projects, even uh, during times that I was trying to work as as a law clerk for law firms, if it didn't resonate with me. It felt like hard work. It just felt like, oh my God, it's like killing me to like continue to focus on this. It just wasn't, if it wasn't getting me here, this felt like I was exploiting my mind for, for things that were completely foreign um, and distant from me. And so I would get tired, you know, fast. <laughs> I would like come home and just be sort of nothing for the whole day. And then like, oh God, I got to go back to that grind again. And so I, to me, it, it felt like, you know, how, how repetitive stress in your body actually causes it to break down. It felt to me like repetitive stress in my mind forcing it to think about stuff it didn't care about just was um, abusing, <laughs> abusing my mind. And, and to top it off, what was really um, disconcerting about it is when I would go back to try to think about the things that really mattered for me, I, I, it took me a while to get back into the groove again. It was, it was sort of like, I know there's something wrong about that. What was it? And it's like, oh God, it's terrible. If you can't articulate why it's a bad thing for people who look like you to be disproportionately poor or disproportionately, if it takes you a little bit more time than it used to, then you got to put that other thing down. So it, it wasn't hard for me. Um, to follow my passion because I hated doing things that I didn't really feel. And I didn't like the way I felt about coming back to things I usually think about when I didn't really have it tight in my head like I I like to have it. So it was great for me to have that experience early because I never had a moment of looking back thinking, oh man, I guess I should have done this thing over here. I'm quite happy 
you know, with with the choices, you know, even though they sometimes get me in trouble and I'm not happy about that. <laughs> but, you know, I don't feel like I made I made bad decisions about, you know, what I think about. I think that's, you know, it's different for for everybody, but, you know, following your heart and your passion, I think having alignment is sometimes the best way to, you know, a, achieve what what you want. Okay. Um, so we know this past uh, Black History Month, the film Black Panther hit theaters. Um, it received both praise and uh, critics. Crit critiques. Um, we know that you had submitted also a <laughs> critical response to this film, and we were wondering if you received any responses in regard to it. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> okay, the reason it's funny is that um, I, I wrote it on Facebook. And so I'm thinking... I'm just writing to people, you know, who know who I know, and and then this is like many times I've been in places and people say, "Talk about your critique of of Panther." It's like, how do you know about that? Like, you don't know how Facebook works, and I clearly don't, right? So I'm gonna think twice a, a, about it in the future. Um, so, so should I talk about the response? <laughs> well, what did I say? Okay, so I'll start. I'll, I'll start with I say. Ooh, this is this is uh, this is the most controversial thing I've said tonight. I've talked about the president. I talked about white nationalism. I talked about my brother's keeper, and now I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I want to talk about black men. <laughs> so, so I'll start by saying I couldn't wait to see Black Panther. I mean, I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, my only disappointment was when it came out, I was scheduled to give a talk at a university. And so I gave the talk, and we were at dinner, and two of the, young, uh, of the students said, Well, sorry, we got to leave because we're going to screen about Black Panther. And I was like, Take me with you. <laughs> And so off I went to to see Black Panther in a you know huge group of, of college students. It was amazing. Everybody was dressed, you know. I was the only one that didn't have any, you know, gear on. If I'd have known, I would have gotten hooked up. But anyway, so so I was there and I was like riding the wave, and it was like a wave. I, I mean, I can't remember. Well, the last time the wave was at like that was like 2008. You know, people were like, "Woo, we have arrived!" and and so, and so I was in it, within, sitting in the middle of the theater. It was just magnificent. So I remember, you know, being just so enraptured, like, right? It was like, oh, look at those black people, and look at those sisters, and oh my God, they're fierce, and they're, they're holding it down, and, and, you know, they're all different, but they're all strong, and I was loving it. And, and, and then there was like this little thing in the back of my mind that just kept nagging at me. And I was like, hush, hush, hush. <laughs> you know, so, so the first thing that just kept nagging at me was like, okay, where's Killmonger's mom? Yeah. Like, ain't no pictures of her. She's not even, she doesn't even have a name, right? She's just like a breeding mare. Like, why can't the sister actually have, so, even if she's dead, you know, it's particularly in a film that um, honors ancestors. Why doesn't she appear on anyone's ancestral plane? Is it just like the people from Wakanda that show up? So, so, so it bugged me, but I was like, oh, maybe we'll hear something at the end or something like that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hear that. I'm enjoying this. I'm not going to go there. And so then I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and I've successfully beaten that back. And then, you know, um, I, hear, I hear the strategy, which is, you know, um, you guys got all this technology. And we've been in, we've been like enslaved for like centuries, and all over the world there's like racial oppression, and there's power here to resist that. So we want some of it. And I was like, well, yeah, that that kind of makes sense to me. And when that got framed, not only as um, inherently um, crazy. Uh, but then the guy who is the CIA yeah. yes. is it becomes part of the family 
by shooting down that aspiration and and we're cheering it I'm thinking what are you doing <laughs> what why are you doing this and and it, I could I so like Nkrumah was coming to my mind and thinking about you know Patrice Lamoon but like uh, the reason we don't have a Wakanda is because of this entity that he represents. And I was thinking, do people know this? Like, do they know the history of suppressing liberationist movements and cultures and, and uh, all this stuff? And I mean, do they know this? And I, 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 so I wrote a piece saying, I was in love with the visual imagery. I was in love with seeing the idea of, you know, people who, you know, look like me finally being able to show their ability to create a society that wants for nothing. I absolutely love that. And at the same time, I couldn't wrap my head around cheering, I'm sorry, for the CIA. I couldn't do it. And it, 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 it pained me that I, I had to, you know, uh, choose between my reading of our history and the celebration of this particular moment. So, so the piece I wrote was, anybody hear me? <laughs> right? Anyone, you know, struggling with this and, and how are you putting it together? So the response you know, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm glad you said that. You know, I was thinking it, but no one else was saying it, so I thought I would keep it to myself. <laughs> right? So I'm like, yeah, I've been there, done that. And then um, others were like, how come you can't let people just enjoy stuff? <laughs> Why you always got to spoil it? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so that, that, was, that was a big thing. And then, and then the purists, the, the Marvel Comics purists, were like, oh, the CIA is always in it. You know, don't take it so seriously. You know, you're being a little literal, you know, about it. And then, and then the last thing I said, and, and this was probably the thing that really got some people. I was like, okay, we so Wakanda's got all these resources, and and it's just a, a marvelous thing. Um, and okay, so we're not going to have, you know, um, negotiations with military might behind it, which actually. It really seems to make the world go round. Let's say that we're going to think our way out of that because that's a disastrous approach to you know building, you know, new a new world order. Is the is the only option buying a couple abandoned buildings in Oakland and creating a STEM program for a handful of people? I mean, really? So you know, there's a lot of. Um, Thinking that's not really deep structural thinking. Like STEM is the is the, is the the, the 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 road to the promised land. Not really. Come on. <laughs> I would have wanted to see something at the end to make me think. Okay, yeah, cool. Let's not do the weapons. That's right. But this is really an avenue to something that's more, you know, fundamentally transformative that we can get behind. So I was a little disappointed there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the next question was, what role do you think you played? Right, we gotta go. <laughs> uh, so I want to uh, take a moment to just thank everyone for coming up and um, everyone that gave input. So I want to pause. A special thank you to Professor Kimberly Crenshaw for. Um, being here today to speak to us. It means the world to us. I want to thank all of you all for coming out today. This has truly been an amazing day for us in, in, in the intersection. Um, you know, it's been a year and uh, since we opened, and we really wanted you to be here last year, but you know, okay. <laughs> but, but certainly for, for you to be here as we celebrate our one year anniversary, it, it, and I know uh, you have challenged me and the rest of our staff to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to truly be intersectional. 
with all of our programs and delivery. And um, our uh, biggest blessing or whatever we want to say in terms of, of who we are and where we are, our students, and I think that you've been able to see that um, mm -hmm. uh, since you've been here. Yes. And um, I can keep on talking because I'm really, really full. But I just want to thank you so much for making this day very, very special to us. And we want to make sure that you remember us all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and sharing this day with us. There will be a reception in front of the intersection. So if you all want to stay around, there will be a reception in front of the intersection. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. 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 <laughs> we got the pose. <laughs>